Okay, so last period, class period, you did a, a leadership study where you looked at the characteristics of effective leaders um, and studied one leader in particular. Today we're going to talk a little bit about other group roles. So while there is usually a leader of the group, um, or at least a um, implicit leader of the group, um, in group development there are often other roles that group members enact. Uh, when when uh, functioning as part of a small group. So let's define what a role is. A group role is a pattern of expected behavior uh, transactions within group members. So how you expect other group members to behave and the role they take on within the group. And you've actually already started to do it with the small groups that you have. Um, you've begun to take on certain roles depending on your personality and roles that you've taken in groups before. Uh, roles can change as the group develops. This past summer, um, I was hired to score the AP English test back in Kansas City, Missouri. And the way they have you score the test is that you sit in tables or groups um, of eight readers, so eight uh, people hired to read essays with a table leader. Um, and the table leader is someone who's been additionally trained to help the eight members score all these AP essays. Well, halfway through our scoring, our table leader's mother got really sick and she left. So she had this particular role of being our table leader, but then she had to leave and so they elected another member of our table to take over as table leader. So his role changed halfway through the week. He went from being a reader to a table leader and we had to become accustomed to a new leader. So that can happen in a group all the time. The roles can change as the group develops or as they get to know each other a little bit better. Um, and in, in a, when it, when groups form, everybody is assigned a role. It's done um, without any communication about it. It just happens. Um, it's part of group behavior and, and the the norms expected of group members just fall into place automatically. The problem happens is that when the roles change or group members enact destructive roles or someone's behavior changes, then we have some role conflict. Like someone who's been leading the group decides suddenly that they don't want to be the leader anymore. Um, or somebody who's been relatively quiet suddenly becomes really dis disruptive. These are things that can really influence um, the roles in your group. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the terminology, and of course you should be taking notes on all of this, whether it's in the study guide or not, right? You should be writing it in additional notes or finding the place in the study guide. There is some discussion in Chapter 8 on rules, so you'll be able to take notes there, but at any time ask to pause the video if you need it. Okay, so um, the first sort of... Um, role idea that we have in groups is a role conflict. And this is when, and I'm sure you've felt this before, when your role in one group um, collides with the role in another. So the role conflicts, overlaps, or interferes with the performance of another role. So you could be a boss, a mother, a friend, an employee, and you, you um, get all those people together and you as a person are going to struggle a little bit because you don't know which role to be. Um, I once had a birthday party and I invited people from work, from my family, from like old friends from high school, um, to college roommates. So all these different roles that I play in my life, they all came together into one room and I had some role conflict, right? People who saw me as a fellow employee or a best friend, right, struggled to see me in a different role. We often say my world's collided, right? That's what we mean is the roles we enact, um, you know, interfere uh, with the other roles that we're trying to play. And it's a little bit hard to negotiate. Um, it, within your group, some role status has occurred. If I asked you right now, everybody turn and point to the person you feel like is the group leader. You know, see who that is. Everybody look at the group leader. That's That hasn't really been explicitly decided. That person is just sort of rose into that, that position or taken charge and the rest of the group has endorsed that or has allowed it to happen. Um, and so that just naturally happens when in groups. Some people take on this leadership position um, and 
and ultimately that's the group approves of that and allows that person to kind of speak for them or be in charge. So maybe you didn't know you were the the leader, right? Maybe you didn't realize that you had taken on that position, but you had. So that's sort of role status. Um, sometimes we ask the person who's always in charge not to be in charge. We do a role reversal where we step directly into the opposite role. Like Sometimes as a teacher, when I have to become a student, right, I go to a class and become a student. That's a little bit of role reversal. Um, or let's say that you are normally an employee, but your boss steps out for the day and says you're in charge, right? You, you kind of have this role uh, reversal. Um, it, 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 it's important to know that role reversal has to depend on role status. So like if you're going to step in to be the leader, the group has to acknowledge that there was a leader, right? You can't just suddenly start leading the group and think that that's going to um, be acknowledged by the rest of the group, right? There has to be that role already and the prestige and the power that comes with it in order to step in it and do it again. Um, there are two types of roles, informal and formal. Um, for, informal roles are more interesting um, because they are not necessarily explicitly decided by the group. So formal roles are like, you're our treasurer, you're our secretary, you're our president. But informal roles are just the natural roles that group members take. In fact, you've already taken one in your group. Um, group theory asserts that no groups work without these informal roles. There are three types, task roles, maintenance roles, and disruptive. So as I describe these, think about your own role and what role you're playing in your group. Are you a part of the task group, the maintenance, or are you perhaps being disruptive? Um, and it's not something that you even know that you've been doing, right? It's just who you are in groups. So the first, um, the first group roles are tasks. These are informal roles. They are the people that move the, the group towards the attainment of its goals. They are all about productivity. So when I give you an activity to do as a group, who is the person who says, we need to get this done? I'm pretty sure that's spelled wrong. Evaluator, there we go. Um, who is the person who like keeps the group moving, who's like, all right, let's get started? Or when you were studying in your study groups, was there a person that was like, come on guys, let's get back to work, right? Those are the task people. I am a very task-driven person. Um, I like to get things done when given a task, I wanna see it through. Um, so I really empathize with these people. We like productivity, we like efficiency, we like to get things done. These are a couple of lists of titles or roles that happen within the task um, informal roles. You have a task leader, so someone who kind of takes charge of the job, the expediter, the person who's like moving the group along, the information provider, so they're the one that knows a lot and is providing the information, the information seeker, the gatekeeper, they're the one who, if the group gets off task, the gatekeeper will bring them back to task and be like, okay, enough talking about homecoming, let's get back to work, right? Like they're the gatekeeper, they kind of control what the group discusses. The recorder, so someone who takes notes a lot. The evaluator, the person who's always trying to decide if what you're doing is productive or good. And even the devil's advocate, which we often see as a negative role, is a positive task role because they're they're helping the group see or work from a different perspective. So are you work driven or work oriented or productivity driven? Um, you may fall naturally into a task role within groups. Um, so kind of look around you in your group and maybe point to a task person. Is there someone in your group that's really task driven um, and wants to get the, the job done? Um, the second group uh, informal role are the maintenance. And these people are so great to have in groups um, because they control the climate and the tension. Their central goal isn't the task, but the relationships of the group members. So they wanna make sure that everybody feels included, that everybody's contributing, that no one's left out, right? They are gonna support, release tension. Sometimes they'll like crack a joke when things get really tough. They'll interpret, so what I hear you saying is this, right? When the tension gets really high, they'll harmonize, so they'll like 
Um, and they'll, if someone, if there's some conflict, they'll, they'll sometimes reduce the tension by harmonizing. What this person's really trying to say is this. They often will compromise. They'll give up something that they want in order to make the group happy. So are there maintenance people in your group? Are the people who are keeping your relationships going, driven by keeping everybody um, feeling included and that the group feeling is good. You have to have both to have an effective group. You have to have people that keep you on track and people that look out for the climate of the group, the way the group feels in order to have an effective group. The third category are the ones that you want to avoid. These are the disruptive roles. So disruptive group members are only focused on themselves. They diminish both the task and the maintenance. So they they hurt the productivity and the cohesiveness of the group. They're people who make group work frustrating, right? They monopolize, they're always cracking jokes, they block other people from being productive, they withdraw or isolate, they could be your social loafers, they could be aggressive, they could be self-centered, so it's all about them, driving the attention to them, they could dominate the conversation. Think about how frustrating it is, I'm sure you've been in groups with these people before, and how frustrating it is, your productivity slows down, you hate the group, so the cohesiveness and the relationships go down as well. Um, so, so you want to um, really deal with these people um, and try and, and get them back to either task or maintenance as soon as possible. And sometimes that's really hard to do. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, what's really interesting is that uh, as you form groups, there's something called role emergence. So um, in the very beginning, if you endorse someone who's disruptive, meaning someone who's constantly joking or or dominating the conversation, if you endorse that subconsciously by giving them time, laughing at their jokes, um, and not dealing with it early on, then that's what they become. They emerge as those roles. Most of the time, people fall into the same roles. You, it's called role specialization. Make sure to write that term down. It's the idea that I'm always a task person in groups. I'm always the one who's trying to move things along, or I'm always the harmonizer. Um, and, and if you get frustrated about doing that, then you have to consciously try not to fall into that role because that's what you'll do subconsciously um, because it's, it's what you have done before. Um, Sometimes people will try and play a certain role even though the group isn't endorsing it. Like someone will try and take charge um, and, and you don't want them to take charge but they'll keep doing that. They're fixating, it's called role fixation on being the leader or being in charge. Um, and that can, be, that can be a problem for the group as well. Um, so that's something to consider and be aware of. Um, probably one of the most famous roles in action experiment, and we're going to watch a little video of this um, when I get back, but it's called the Stanford Prison Experiment. In the 1970s, um, a psychologist at Stanford University, Philip Zimbago, Zimbargo, Zimbago, um, he decided to... Um, he wanted to see by giving someone a role, by either a prisoner or uh, a guard, if that changed their behavior. So he um, hired a bunch of male college students between the ages of 18 and 24, 25, um, and paid them $15 a day to participate in this experiment. The students were randomly chosen either to be guards or prisoners. And in the basement of the psychology building, they set up this prison. Um, and so they had the students arrested that were prisoners. They had them arrested um, and then brought to the facility. They were dressed, first they were strip searched, which was part of the uh, humiliation and the loss of power. Um, and then they were put in these like, um, doctory sort of shift outfits that were pretty difficult um, and they had to wear like f really um, embarrassing like nylon hose hat things you can see them in this picture and then the guards were given uniforms and sunglasses because they didn't want the guards to show their eyes um, and they sort of let it play out they they put the prisoners in these classrooms that were made to be like prisons they were locked in there um, there was no sense of day or night and um, the guards after the first day really began to shake things up they really 
um, took on the role of being in charge and they started waking the prisoners up at all hours and they started making them do humiliating things like cleaning bathrooms and things like that and and the goal was really like playing with these concepts of role, role reversal, a normal law-abiding citizen becoming a prisoner, something he's not used to, playing with status, so guard versus prisoner, right? And you can kind of see how some of the humiliation techniques that were allowed. Now today, ethically, the experiment, the Stanford Prison Experiment, would not be allowed to happen because of the psychological impact on the prisoners and the guards. Um, it wouldn't pass ethic boards today. Um, and you can see that they sort of let it unfold um, and, and really didn't draw a line until um, later into the experiment when they realized that there were some people being really psychologically affected by this experiment. And we'll watch a little video on it so you can see, you know, people were specialized and fixated on their roles. They weren't allowed to change them and um, really focused in on that. And at one point, the researcher, here's our researcher, Philip Zimbago, he, he was standing guard because he was the warden. Um, he was standing guard outside one prisoner's door. One prisoner in particular um, wanted to go home and they kind of convinced him not to and so he was showing some signs of mental distress um, and and there was some rumors that there was going to be a breakout. I mean it kind of got out of control um, and Philip Zimbargo um, was sitting outside of, his, of this prisoner's door guarding it and a colleague came up to him and began to ask him questions like that were that were driven by ethics. What are, what are you trying to accomplish here? How are you protecting the the students involved? And and Philip, the researcher, realized um, that he too had gotten caught up in the role of being the warden, um, and that he had forgotten or lost touch a little bit with with the reality and the truth and the fact that this wasn't real. Um, and so that's when they decided actually to end the experiment early and try to to really break down what had happened and give counseling and some, some help to those that had participated. Um, so, so it's an amazing, I mean, we've seen in history time and time again, if you look at Nazi Germany or places where people in power are given a lot of freedom in that role, it's often abused. Um, Stanley Milgram, the Milgram experiment is another very famous um, research or experiment at around the time, uh, it was actually about 10 years before in the 1960s, and we'll talk more about that later, where where um, people were given power over other people and it went badly. So we have to be really careful with the rules we enact and the power and the status that we give to those rules. Um, we're going to go back to leadership now and watch Brain Games on, on following the leader and how we're so influenced by um, by what others are doing. And so some of that plays into our group theory as well.